Uh, unless you've been living under a rock, social media and Web 2.0 is pretty important right now. And especially for those of us that have interest in the investment community, uh, there's a good, good connection between the two and a good overlap. And here today to discuss that is IU alum and founder of the blog, Ignore Returns, Pat Escada. Uh, thank you, Lance. It's, um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be in Bloomington and a pleasure to be back at IU uh, just kind of talking about social media and how it is that I'm, I'm standing before you. I saw, um, I saw a tweet from Mike Bellafiore at SMB Capital who is um, active, in the proprietary, uh, in, active in proprietary trading and also um, an active participant in kind of in social media and he put out a tweet talking about um, talking about anybody who, you know, anybody uh, involved with IU who might be, you know, might be, might be interested, um, you know, you know, get, you know, contact me. And I did. I, I, I know Mike previously. I've interviewed him for my, uh, for my show on Stock Twits TV. So I shot him an, e I shot him an email. He shot me an email. We got in contact with Lance. We spoke in the fall, and we, you know, eventually arranged this here for, uh, you know, this talk for, um, you know, for the spring. So. It's just kind of a small example of how things uh, kind of tend to work out. So, as Lance said, um, I am I am an alumnus of Indiana University. I graduated with degrees in economics and political science. So I wasn't uh, wasn't in the Kelly School. I have an MBA from uh, the University of Chicago. But uh, like a lot of bloggers, I check my um, I check my stats every morning uh, to see who's visiting, how often they're visiting, what they're reading. And this past week, and often on many days, I see, I'm always happy to see Bloomington uh, as one of, the, uh, one of the sources of visitors for my blog. So kind of, you know, at the top, you kind of see the, the typical ones you would think, New York, Los Angeles, uh, Boston, Chicago. You go a little bit farther down, you get to the, you know, the Vancouver's, the Bloomington's, and the, uh, the Hong Kong's. So it just kind of shows, it's interesting because it shows you a bit, a bit about the reach of, um, you know, some blogs can have, but it's also interesting to see just, you know, kind of close to home that, uh, uh, you know, one of, my, one of my adopted homes, Bloomington, is, you know, as the source of visitors for the blog. So that's always, that's always interesting for me to see. Um, and so I, when, I, when I was putting this together, I wanted to make sure that I, uh, you know, kind of put up front a little bit of a disclaimer. And I've, I've written a post about this, and it's kind of a uh, it's kind of an unwritten rule, not only about kind of about financial media in general, and the, and the fact is that everybody talks their book, and when I say everybody, I mean everybody, and that's me included. So, whether you know whether you're seeing somebody on CNBC, whether you're reading a quote from somebody in the Wall Street Journal, uh, whether you're reading something on a blog, I mean you have to have an understanding that everybody, when they're talking about a you know they're talking about a particular position or a viewpoint. Um, you have to, you have to understand that they're they're consciously or unconsciously talking about the things that they believe in. So whether it's a position in their portfolio, a particular stock, they're going to talk about things about which they believe in. And usually this is all above board um, and legit. Sometimes it's not so. There are some nefarious purposes for talking your book. But so in that sense, I want to just you know, so in that sense, I want to you know kind of put that disclaimer out there. And in that sense. Just so, that, just so that you know, Abnormal Returns is a part of a, a company called StockTwits um, for about the last, uh, last year or so. So I'm going to be mentioning StockTwits throughout the talk, in part because StockTwits is kind of an important part of uh, kind of the intersection between social media and investing. So I just want to make sure that you know that and that, um, that I, when, I, when I talk about StockTwits, and then kind of your standard disclaimer that all opinions expressed are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of StockTwits itself. Um, and just before, and just before I go any farther, um, kind of the size of the room and the number of people here, um, I want to make sure that you all feel comfortable and um, or that anybody can ask a question at any time. Put your hand up. Um, this is a you know a very inf very informal discussion, and especially when you're talking about uh, you know talking about social media and talking about how it is that you you know we interact with each other um, online in regards to investments. I just want to make sure that everybody feels. You know, feels you know comfortable in doing that, and kind of a further disclaimer. Um, I want to you know I want to talk a little bit more about predicting the future, and especially when you're talking about something about social media, which is really you know is a really a new phenomenon, especially in sort of a mass way. Um, the fact is that re really nobody knows where this is all heading. I mean, we're all kind of we're all just kind of riding this wave 
um, kind of going forward. And I don't think anybody, anybody who tells you where, where social media is going to be in a year, two years, five years, or 10 years, I think is, um, you know, might be selling you a bill of goods. So I saw, this, I saw this quote in the past week, and it's, human behavior cannot be predicted. Distrust anyone who claims to know the future, however dimly. So anything I say is, you know, when talking about the future really is, sure, is sheer conjecture. And especially when it comes to the markets, one of the, the tagline for, that I chose for my blog five years ago is that it was a, a wide-ranging forecast-free blog. So uh, there's not a lot of forecasts, and, and these aren't, and what we're talking about today aren't necessarily, aren't necessarily forecasts either, either, so. And so we're kind of, so we're talking about the social media revolution, and that's really, that's uh, the part, investing is really part and parcel of that. And I don't need to tell you guys the importance of social media. Um, you know, when I was going to college many moons ago, you know, email was a, wasn't even, wasn't even a, a phenomenon. So you guys who've grown up with these, with these tools, um, you know, the Facebooks, the Twitters, and all these things, you guys kind of inherently understand social media in a, in a, in a better way than people who really didn't grow up with it do. And, that's, and I think that's important as we talk about it, because especially in the investment world, and I think it's, um, it becomes more important because, you know, in the investment world, you're talking about people who are dealing with quite literally billions, billions of dollars. And so there's a bit of, um, you know, people are somewhat entrenched in the way that they view the world. And they're in that sense, being conservative in that sense is kind of a good thing. You don't want to be um, kind of jumping on fads, fad to fad to fad. Um, but in that sense, I think social media, I think, is becoming so ingrained in our lives. And I think you guys have a kind of an inherent understanding of that. Um, I think it's something you kind of can't ignore. And the way that it plays out in regards to investing, I think is going to be um, very interesting going forward. And kind of a benchmark for that is really talking about, you know, I bet, I bet all of you guys are probably on Facebook in some form or fashion. And the fact that a company like Facebook is, has a, a value, an implied valuation of ex, in excess of 70 billion, and that was a number that I got just this past week um, due to, uh, uh, using some secondary market transactions, it just you know even though that that's that's kind of a benchmark, I think we're still kind of in this, the early of stages of the way that this that the social media revolution is going to play out. And the fact that it's spring, it's March first. I'm kind of in a baseball mood. Um, if you want to put a time frame on it, we'll call it we'll kind of call it the second inning of the um, social media revolution. And when I'm say when I say revolution, I mean literally revolution. I mean anybody who's been watching the news over the past few weeks um, has probably learned in one way or another the the, um, the role that social media tools, Facebook and Twitter, have played in um, kind of the the unrest that we're seeing in the Middle East. And this is a picture from from Egypt. And I thought it was just kind of telling the fact that um, I think a lot of people, a lot of the leisure, leaders in Egypt and Tunisia kind of noted the importance of these tools in, uh, in their ability to communicate and to you know, organize gatherings and, and to you know, eventually um, you know, uh, over, you know, change, change their form of government. And as, as I was talking about Facebook before, and then there's a neat graph from TechCrunch which kind of shows, shows you that it's, um, it's a little tough to see all of the uh, uh, some of these um, some of these benchmarks over time, but I think you kind of get the picture when you kind of take a look at Facebook back you know back in 2004. We're talking you know uh, movie we're talking social network Facebook back then, um, and now we're talking about as we go over time. There's a um, there's a Microsoft investment in there which kind of set a high mark for Facebook's valuation back in 2007, and now if you go you know if you go all the way now to uh, February. Um, you know, February of this year, you're looking at a $70 billion valuation. So again, um, you know, it's not necessary, that isn't necessary, I don't know that necessarily validates things, but it kind of just kind of gives you some sense for what's going on. And if anybody who reads, you know, if anybody who's an, uh, a reader of uh, this, talking about venture capital and angel investing, this entire space, talking about the social media space, whether it be Facebook or Twitter or, you know, or something like social gaming like Zynga, that entire space has really kind of sucked a lot of the oxygen out of the venture capital space, and people are really uh, have kind of really focused in on this as a, um, a, a potential area for investment. 
And so uh, kind of switching gears, if we, kind of, if we say that we've established that social media has, you know, it's kind of here to stay and it's kind of changing the world, um, you know, let's kind of think about how it is, how it is that it's really going to do that. Um, and like I said, we've talked about how, what, what social media has done over the past few weeks, and you can kind of see the role that it's played. Um, and then you can see how it's, it's really tr it's transformed the way that information flows. So instead of having some sort of hierarchical, hierarchical sense of infra information flowing down from government or from media, you kind of get this, uh, it's almost in a certain sense chaotic, chaotic pattern of information flows. Um, and I think that this start, you know, part of this, this isn't necessarily a new phenomenon. It's in part, you know, it's kind of driven by the, by the rise of the internet itself. Um, but it's kind of accelerated by the ability of these tools to connect people um, over distance and over, you know, and over time. So, um, and, given, and given these facts, it shouldn't see, be particularly surprising that social media is going to have an impact on the world of uh, finance and investing. Um, does anybody have any questions at this point while I take a drink? So you guys are all familiar with, familiar with um, you know, social media. Like I said, you guys are probably, a lot of you guys are, on, are already on Facebook. And there's this meme, being, this meme has been going around Twitter. Um, and I thought it was kind of helps to put in perspective what we're talking about here. So um, it's a bit crude, but it is funny. So Facebook, I peed. Um, Twitter, I need to pee. Foursquare, I'm peeing here, so like location service. YouTube, watch this pee. And what about investing? Stock twits, long pee. So using this, using the dollar sign and a symbol, um, kind of showing how it is that you know different social media tools kind of look at the world somewhat differently. And um, stock twits is um, a tool for a, a social media tool for uh, connecting um, connecting investors, traders and other people interested in the markets. So um, what is StockTwits? Uh, I'll get this, I'll get this um, advertisement out of the way here. It was named one of the best sites in 2010 by Time Magazine. StockTwits is an open community powered idea and information service for investments. Um, it allows people to um, connect, eavesdrop on different traders and investors. Um, it allows you to follow different stocks, even private companies. So I was talking about you know, the likes of Facebook and Twitter and things like that. There are symbols for those which allow people to uh, post messages about those as well. And there's an, there's an active secondary market in those companies. So again, um, there, is, uh, there's, there are different ways for people to interact and connect, whether it be connecting with individuals or you can actually just follow, follow particular symbols, which allows you to, if you're very focused in on a particular industry or a particular company, you can just follow what people are saying on those. Um, about those companies and stock totes was kind of built on uh, built on the back of Twitter obviously given given the name um, but it's in fact kind of um, grown into its own service in and of itself um, it's oftentimes the case that Twitter will be down but stock twits is still kind of humming along so um, but it's more uh, but it's more than just that and I think it's it aspires to be more than that and I think it's been called a number of different things the one that I always like to use was the social Bloomberg um, People call it the human ticker, and um, the CEO of StockTwits also happens to call it the, the American idol of finance. And the idea being that it allows you to, in, in a big community like that, eventually, and not surprisingly, some people are going to kind of rise up, um, kind of bubble up through that firmament, and you can kind of see some of those people who have um, certain skill sets, and uh, they kind of bubble up, and you can kind of um, allows them different sorts of opportunities over time. And uh, what we call the stream, which is kind of the stream of news and information that flows through StockTwits, um, has been integrated into various um, kind of various brand name services that you see here, Bloomberg and CNN Money and Yahoo Finance. So if you post a message on StockTwits, um, it'll get picked up also by um, some of these services as well. So kind of moving a bit, moving a bit away from the specific of um, stock twits and moving, talking more about social media and investing in general, um, like, I, like I mentioned before, talking about social media revolution, the idea that information flows kind of only one way and in kind of in a certain stream, whether it be from, you know, whether it be top down from Wall Street down, um, I think that's obviously changing. And I think, you, I think we kind of all 
um, intuitive, intuitively understand why that, that's changing. Um, and we were talking, we were talking about at dinner, talking about Bloomberg and, and Bloomberg, which is a huge, a huge entity, a huge media powerhouse at this point, was really created by um, was created by Michael Bloomberg. It was really driven on the back of his ability to bring together some of the you know information at that point, which wasn't um, which was really just kind of siloed in various different um, investment banks and kind of bring it together. And he was able to charge vast amounts of money for people who were thirsting for that information, and is still able to do that. And they've obviously been able to. Um, use that use that revenue flow into um, you know into move into different areas, particularly media specifically news and media. Um, but I think the fact that today um, information is now flowing in every direction, um, whether it be you know Wall Street specifically has been kind of downgraded in a, in a certain respect by the degree to which information flows all sorts of in different directions and at different times. And I think. You know, one interesting way in which it's happening is is just geographically. I think, in a certain respect, you know, markets more so than ever never really close, and it's really just kind of one continuous market from, you know, depending upon how you open it, whether it be you know Australia or Tokyo, Tokyo onward, around the globe, the market really doesn't close, and you know that information is always flowing. Especially, you know, we talked about it earlier, talking about the social media revolution and talking about unrest in the Middle East. You know that information um, is already affecting mark. You know is already affecting you know the oil markets in London. And by the time you wake up, you know in uh, you know in New York or Chicago or in Bloomington, you know the markets have already, to a large degree, already have moved and they've already incorporated some of this information that's already that's already been flowing. So um, in a certain respect, when it's when the information is flowing that direction, um, it's a bit of a, it's almost a. Uh, a bit of a letdown by the time you get to New York time. So again, information is all flowing and flowing in all sorts of different different directions. And the question is how you you know how are you able to capture that and process some of that. And I think social media is one of those ways in which we try and um, connect with people and try and connect with um, connect with information. And I think one of the ways in which um, a lot of people are trying to look at social media is the way that it transmits sentiment. And you know, obviously, you can do that in a, a couple of you know, you can do that a couple of different ways. One is kind of an, in a kind of on a one-off fashion is kind of looking at, you know, you could do it specifically looking at a particular symbol or a particular company and what's happening with that and try and capture that in a certain respect. But you could also do it at a macro level in a sense, um, trying to capture what it is the sentiment is on. Um, you know, a lot of it's, a lot of the work has been done with Twitter, um, but trying to capture. The information that's inherent in these streams of uh, streams of data and streams of opinion, and you can actually, you can in fact call it a social signal, as it were. And the value, and we're talking about here, the value of the social signal. And Howard Lindzen, who is the CEO of StockTwits, he said there was a quote from him um, from a post earlier this week, and he says, "The age of the social signal is upon us. All the signal is in today's activity streams, and the hedge funds are going to figure this out." And he was talking. The context was he was talking to a number of different hedge funds hedge fund managers who are trying to get their heads around how it is that they can um, capture this social signal in kind of a systematic way and use it in their, um, you know, use it in their investing and trading. And obviously one of the big high profile uh, attempts to do this was obviously here at IU, Professor Bull, and I think he's in the School of Informatics, um, had a study talking about trying to measure, um, try, trying to measure sentiment on Twitter and trying to correlate that with um, stock market movements, and he and he found for the period that he was looking at, he found um, some pretty good results. And I think that kind of that was a bit of a wake up call to a lot of people trying to, um, uh, I think, who were skeptical that there was any sort of information in there. Um, and so, like I said, you can try to capture from kind of a macro perspective, kind of from the top down, um, or you can kind of do it from the bottom up and kind of do it on a company by company basis. And obviously, that's. That's easy to do with bigger, you know, with bigger companies that are more talked about. You know, your Apples, your Googles, um, in which there's a fair amount of flow. And it's obviously as you kind of as you go down the market cap scale and uh, the interest scale, it's more difficult to try and pick up some of that signals. And I think on a systematic basis, but that doesn't mean there. I mean, I think um, that doesn't mean there isn't, um, you know, potential potential information um, in those in those streams as well. And if we're talking about social media, the effect of social media on investing, 
I think we're talking about um, we're talking about affecting essentially every aspect of investing, and I think um, how it, how that plays out I think is again open to uh, interpretation. But here are just I think here are some different ways that I thought about how you might think about uh, think about how it might affect different um, sub segments of um, kind of the um, investing world. So whether it be from you know, a short-term trader to investors to uh, professional analysts, um, financial advisors, um, investor relations is another big area in which social media is kind of transforming the way that they kind of do business. And it kind of goes all the way to um, just the structure of particular industries and the way, and the way that companies operate themselves. So I'm kind, of, I'm kind of switching terminology a little bit and talking about the social web um, in, in a certain respect, social, social media implies, again, kind of a, a bit of a, kind of, it's a bit of a media bias. And I think social web, I think is a little bit more, um, maybe a little bit more specific and a little bit more um, kind of all encompass, en encompassing. And kind of thinking about it, maybe in the, if you, anybody who's been on stock to its nose, you know, the, the most likely use of it is by traders. And um, the fact is that technology now allows traders to trade independent of, of location. Um, they're able to create their own workspace, their own workflow. And I think it used to be the case when technology was more expensive, you oftentimes individual traders were either trading specifically on a floor of an exchange or they were in an upstairs sort of location where they were kind of really dependent upon um, kind of the, the economies of scale that accrued um, from the, that for those sorts of technologies. So, like we mentioned before, a Bloomberg or other sorts of feeds that are, used to be very expensive and that are now have been, com have been commoditized. So real-time quotes, I know you guys don't believe this, real-time quotes used to be like a big deal. To be able to get real-time quotes was expensive and, um, and now it's, you know, every site has, you know, has real-time quotes. It's, you know, it's pretty much, a, it's become commoditized. So, and it's interesting, there's um, some of the people who who've come to StockTwits from um, the trading floor have kind of described StockTwits as kind of a virtual pit. So anybody who um, knows about how uh, the trading floors worked, they weren't, just an, they weren't just a place for people to conduct trades. There was also, it was also kind of like a subculture in and of itself. Information was exchanged, you know, bets were made, fights were had, you know, it was kind of everything all at once. There was, it was almost kind of like its own little community. And when those kind of have gone away, I mean, there are a few, you know, there's still a few of those left, but a lot of that has gone electronic. So those traders who are looking for um, the ability to interact with other traders kind of need, um, need a service. And I think the social web allows those traders to interact. And um, a lot of the same function, functionality that you saw in the pits is kind of, has been taken up by um, social media. So whether it be sharing ideas, uh, particular trade setups, news, gossip, you know, all that stuff can now um, kind of flows electronically. And so that, com that camaraderie that was there in physical settings um, is now available in kind of a, a virtual sense. Um, and, and, if, and, if, and has anybody heard of the book that called The Futures? Um, it was written by, uh, I just, I interviewed the author um, a couple weeks ago, Emily Lambert, and she kind of talks um, Kind of, it's an interesting book because it kind of talks about the evolution of the futures exchanges, um, speci specifically starting in Chicago. And what was interesting there was that, you know, those exchanges started really out of kind of f physical location and necessity. The market was on one side of the street, and you know, the futures ex the futures exchange as it was was on one side of the street, and the actual place, the actual warehouses, and where the actual transactions in these commodities like butter and eggs was literally across the street. So it was kind of a sort of symbiotic relationship. And you kind of, you can kind of see the evolution of the futures markets over time and how it is we've kind of become, you know, become uh, completely disengaged from location in that sense. Um, whether it be the exchange itself, which is really just, you know, a warehouse full of servers or um, the actual traders themselves. So, and so for people, for traders who use, um, you know, very, use the social web to uh, kind of recreate some of these sorts of interactions. You know, the challenge is, is trying to assemble kind of a team, the kind of the people that you follow and kind of a virtual team that kind of a maximi maximizes your opportunity, minimizes the amount of time that you waste, and allows you to really 
um, you know, approach the markets with, um, you know, the, your particular mindset. So I think it's, it's an interesting challenge and um, people have written about how it is that you can um, kind of put together these sorts of, um, these kind of virtual teams as it were. And so kind of moving, kind of moving from the most, you know, the shortest time frame and moving kind of up the scale, um, you know, talking about investors and talking about a bit of, bit of a different time frame. And one of the, thing, one of the interesting things is um, kind of the flow of non-traditional news. And it's, often t and it's, it's sometimes the case that um, news gets broken um, in these sorts of settings long before it ever reaches um, kind of the front page of uh, the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times like that. And there was a case with um, Chipotle um, a couple weeks ago and a, and a blogger, one of the um, bloggers that I'm familiar with, Derek Kernquist, was talking about this. And there was, a, there was an item that came across talking about Chipotle had um, filed for some trademarks for, um, they were planning to go into, start an Asian, um, a pan-Asian themed restaurant chain. And that was, that was kind of the first official, quote unquote, official um, source of that news. And that, and that showed up on the stream a couple weeks before it ever made the Wall Street Journal. So people who were interested in Chipotle and were viewed that, op viewed the uh, potential to expand into a different sort of um, restaurant theme and would view that positively, um, given the success that Chipotle has had, um, they kind of got a little bit of a head start on, on that sort of news flow. So again, and not just, and you kind of have that on a one-off case, but you also kind of have it happening in kind of a real-time collaborative sense. So when, new, when earnings are announced or news breaks, um, you know, essentially the stream kind of lights up with people talking about it, asking questions, uh, garnering feedback. So again, um, these are kind of ways in which you can kind of take advantage of of those sites of tools. And there's a site, um, and for, for doing modeling, modeling is obviously, obviously less, less of a, uh, a real-time sort of thing, but there's sites like Trefis, um, which allow you to do, essentially, for lack of a better term, it's kind of collaborative analysis. You kind of, everybody's looking at the same model, and you're really just, you're kind of tweaking the different variables, um, which allows you to come up with different values and different sorts of scenarios for various companies. So, I think tools like that, which allow, which allow people to do this sort of collaborative um, analysis, I think, are, um, I think are really interesting. Whether it's a, whether it's a business, I don't know. But I think, I think you're going to see more and more of that. And it allows you to focus less on the model, kind of hand building a model in Excel. It really just focuses you on the key drivers of a, of a particular company. And if you go to the site, you can kind of um, you can check it out and see. They have some models already built. And you know, there's, um, interesting ones to look at, like things like Apple allows you to look at, um, you know, change, change assumptions for iPad sales, change assumptions for iPhone sales, and you can really get, um, you know, you can kind of get a sense for, for what's going on there. And kind of going, and, and that kind of trans 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 transitions us into analysis as well. And I'm talking a little bit more here about professional analysts, uh, you know, working in a um, kind of a professional setting. And I think more of this is happening. And I think Part of, it is ha part of it's happening because I think people realize that um, just because you, let's say, just because you necessarily put an idea out there doesn't mean it's necessarily taken up by everybody um, right away. So if I say, if, let's say I go on stock puts and Twitter and I have, uh, make some sort of, um, you know, make some sort of statement, you know, some sort of definitive statement about, you know, I think XYZ is a potential takeover candidate. Some people are going to dismiss it out of hand. Some people are going to say, hmm, that's interesting, might happen. Maybe I'll look a little bit more into it. You know, and some people might, you know, what you, some people might in a knee jerk fashion just buy XYZ. Um, but I think you'd be, you know, I think the reason why people are reluctant to share ideas is the idea that, oh, people are going to jump on that idea right away. The stock's going to go from um, where it is today, where I say it's going to be in, in an instant fashion. And I think that's, um, I, think that, I think that overstates the ability of markets to uh, integrate those sorts of opinions. So, um, and so I think more, anal no, more professional analysts are kind of viewing um, social settings as a way to use other people to um, vet their ideas, get feedback, get criticism. Um, you know, people, people work over their assumptions and there are, um, 
a number of different professional networks that have risen up um, to allow people to do that. And some, a couple of them are, some, you know, one of them is called Sum Zero, and one other one's a Distret Debt Investors Club. Um, and these are kind of invite only. These are for, um, uh, you know, kind of professional analysts only, people who are working in, um, you know, working primarily on the buy side, already working on the buy side, and they kind of, um, people put their ideas up there, um, their theses up there, and let, you know, and have people um, kind of go at them and kind of uh, uh, help people kind of take them apart, as it were. So again, I think whether, like, you know, I, so I think to the degree to which, whether we're talking about an individual, you know, a day trader sitting at home in his home office or somebody working in, um, you know, a hedge fund or an investment advisor, I think, um, I think these tools are, like I said, kind of um, becoming more widespread. And what we're talking about here is talking about the social web and advisors, really kind of, kind of talking about financial advisors and investment managers. And investment advisors are kind of, I think they're slowly beginning to learning to embrace the social web. Um, and I think more slowly, I think there are obviously some regulatory constraints on the ability of, um, of a lot of investment advisors to use some of these tools, but I think that's eventually going to get, you know, um, I think there's going to be more clarity there. Um, and, I'm, and, you know, a kind of a straightforward use of the social web would be as a lead generation tool. So if you're an investment advisor, financial advisor, um, one of your primary goals and aims is to um, garner more clients, and that's obviously one way in which you can use it, but I think a more sophisticated use of it is um, kind of putting your ideas out there in a certain sense, kind of putting your best, kind of putting your best foot forward and letting people kind of follow you in a real-time fashion and allow them to become more comfortable what it is, with what it is that you're doing. And there are a, a couple of really interesting posts on that. And I think to that degree, um, if somebody comes to you in an organic fashion and says, look, I like the way that you've been talking about, I like the way that you, like the way that you approach the markets, I like the way that you trade, I think the way that you're, um, you know, I like, like some of your analysis, that's in a certain sense a more organic way for you to garner a client than for me to come, you know, cold call you and say, look, you know, here's me, you know, here are my returns, you know, aren't these great, you know, come, you know, write me a check for and open up an account. So in that sense, if you're able to create what is um, kind of a two-way flow of information rather than um, a one-way flow, I think it kind of creates better matches and hopefully creates you know, better outcomes both for um, you know, the investor and the advisor. And like I, and like I mentioned earlier, one of the ways in which this is happening is investor relations as well. And there was an example a couple of weeks ago of Microsoft, somebody who would, you, know, you would think would have a pretty good handle on technology. Um, their, their earnings release was, um, for lack of a better term, leaked online early. And that was essentially somebody poking around the Microsoft web, you know, investor relations website and seeing um, the, rele the forthcoming release up there. And that was, um, that information came out and was released onto, um, you know, stock twits and people had a chance to take a look at Microsoft's earnings, um, you know, before they ever hit the kind of the, the tape as it were. Um, and I think there was just this, just a couple days ago, it was um, announced, uh, or it was the analysis Google has been downgrading some um, sites that are viewed as, uh, whether it be content farms or things like that, they've been downgrading them in their, in their search results. And some of, the, so, some of the sites that have been getting downgraded are some of these third-party sites that host investor relations information. So that these sites that have you know, earnings releases, um, different sorts of presentations from companies. So these things have been kind of been going down the, the Google search results. And I think it's interesting. And it kind of forces, I think it's going to force companies to become uh, kind of owners of this information rather than paying somebody to kind of host this kind of third-party site which has been done for a long, long time. I think these companies are realizing that they kind of have to own this investor relations space and kind of take a, take a hold of, um, you know, kind of the, these, these interactions that they have with investors. And again, if we take a really big macro look at what's going on with the social web and, and with uh, various companies, um, you can, you know, you, if you think about your own use of uh, social media tools. You can then think about how that might happen in within a company, and you know, it would allow people to communicate in a different way rather than just you know emailing each other or picking up a phone or calling a meeting. There are different ways now in which people are able to use these social tools internally. It's a good, it, the, the bigger question is whether they really can sort of transform any sort of large scale organization in an important way 
Um, and there's examples of which the way that some companies are using um, sites like Facebook and Twitter. So if you, you know, if you're, if you ever have a bad customer experience with a company, go on Twitter, go on Facebook, um, put something up there. Cause there's, you know, if companies, a lot of companies are monitoring these, um, these spaces and you might get a, re, you know, get a response back and, um, you know, they might be able to help you with your, um, and, you know, might be able to help you with your issue, help you with your issue. But in kind of a bigger sense, the question is whether companies that were, you know, built up on kind of the old uh, traditional sorts of corporate models, when they come into contact with or come into competition with companies that have been kind of built with um, the social media and the social web in mind, it would be interesting to see how those, how those companies sort of interact. And you see a lot of the startups in the internet space are these type of companies that are kind of built from, um, kind of from the social web up, excuse me. You know, I'm a blogger, so I sit in front of my computer most of the day, and I don't have to talk to too many people. Um, so my voice isn't, uh, isn't used to all this sort of, uh, all, all this talking, so. So talking a little bit about the social web and, and the bottom line, and I want to talk a little bit about blogging because um, that's what I know the most about. But the social web is something in which I'm kind of sitting at the intersection of these two. So, um, and there was an interesting post a couple of days ago talking about it was a it was a kind of an interesting way of framing the way uh, framing the way um, the, the social web and talking about curated membership communities, the idea of people um, things like stock toys and other other sorts of verticals in this space where people are able to come together um, and interact in certain fashion. They're able to create group relationships um, that weren't there before. They're able to um, exchange social capital and they're able to create different opportunities. And there is a whole host of um, ways in which, you know, that I've learned on stock goats that people have interacted, have gotten together, people have come together and formed hedge funds and different sorts of opportunities just by finding people on these sorts of networks and finding people of like mind. So, um, and, that, and that in a sense kind of erases geography in a certain sense. So in the end, these social tutors are being embraced for their ability to influence ideas and relationships and ultimately actions. So, and that's what really matters. It's one, you know, being able to talk with somebody um, in a different state or a different country in real time is great, but if it doesn't ultimately affect the way you act um, in your own life or act in a broader sense, um, then it's really just, then it's really just, it's not necessarily a tool, it's really just um, a, something a little less substantial than that. Um, and I'm just going to go, I'm going to talk about blogs quickly just because it's something in which I have um, a fair amount of experience, but if there, are there any questions about you know, anything that I've talked about to date, I just want to talk about blogs real quickly and then um, I'll finish up from there, so. And so, talking about blogs, um, blogs used to, you know, there's a great deal of chatter now about the death of blogs and um, again, I think it's one of those things where um, you guys have a very different perspective on it than I do. When I started blogging five years ago, it was still um, very nascent and it wasn't necessarily um, something, you know, you didn't necessarily um, want to put your name to it. And when I started blogging, I was blogging um, with a pseudonym to start because I thought, you know, I want to start this blog, I want to talk about different stuff, but I've went, if I want to try and get a job in a traditional sort of old line investment management firm again, I don't know if I want my name on this thing. So that's kind of how I started off and that's, it's kind of a very different perspective than what you see now. And I think um, the evolution of the blogosphere is, re is really interesting because you know, 10 years ago or five years ago, Facebook wasn't there, Twitter wasn't there, these other sorts of social media tools weren't there, and really kind of the easiest and best outlet for people was the blog, whether it be something really hyper-personal, talking about, you know, uh, you know, talking about raising your own kids, or something artistic, um, it's kind of changed. Those sorts of personal, the personal blog is kind of transformed, it's kind of moved on to you know, it's moved on to the Facebook, it's moved on to different sorts of, um, different sorts of media. That doesn't mean they aren't out there, but I think those have become kind of the preferred tools for kind of personal blogging. In a certain respect, the blogosphere has become professionalized. Um, and like, you know, like you said, there's um, just starting with Facebook and Twitter, but there's all sorts of other sorts of verticals um, that allow you to communicate in different forms and fashion um, and in different sorts of media as well, so. And so, uh, 
And so in the, the degree to which the blogosphere in the financial, in the financial world has been uh, professionalized, and I call it the blogification of the financial media, every financial news outlet now has, has embraced blogs in one form or another. Um, I think they, in a certain respect they did it reluctantly, uh, but they have embraced it. And I think all of the big financial media um, outlets have, have viewed the blog as not only um, a way of reaching different sorts of audiences, but it's an also way, it's an also a way to um, transmit news and information as well. Um, news all doesn't flow, doesn't all flow down on you know, page A1 of the Wall Street Journal anymore. It flows in all sorts of different ways. And I think over time, um, we really won't be making any sort of distinction between old media and new media. It's all going to be new media at some point when, when guys like you, um, kind of uh, people who have grown up with the social, have uh, grown up with the social web become involved, whether it be uh, you know, on, in the financial media or in investing itself, um, it really won't become, there won't really, we won't really be making a distinction between the two. Um, and so in that respect, um, the, the, funny, the blogosphere, which was once, um, you know, made up entirely of amateurs, has become uh, professionalized to a large degree. And if you take a look at, um, you know, the, some of the biggest blogs, they're now, they're now driven by, you know, larger firms or professional firms that have the ability to, pay, you know, to pay bloggers, um, you know, a paycheck and allow them to really, really put their full effort into, um, you know, their blogs. And, um, you know, blogs, why blog? There's a number, you know, number of different ideas. And some of this kind of goes back to what we were talking about, the social web, kind of exposing your ideas to the sunlight, getting feedback, getting uh, criticism. And I think that's, that's a big way. And another idea um, in that respect is idea retention. Um, if you're just on Twitter, tw you know, putting ideas out all the time, um, that stuff's pretty, um, there's not really a great way to search for that stuff. So if you want to kind of have a place, a home for your own ideas and kind of putting your best foot forward and your best ideas out there, um, a blog is still one way in which you can do that. And we were talking about collaboration and feedback um, and talking about uh, brand building as well. You know, some people, when they start a blog, the idea is that, oh, I'm going to build up my personal brand, you know, and this will kind of be my calling card. And I think that's true to a degree. I think there's, there's a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, I think there's some disagreements about that. But I think in terms of, um, you know, making that an outpost for yourself on the web, I think that's, uh, I think that is a, a viable idea. And I think um, talking about blogging as a, as a profession, it's difficult. And I think most people who start up a blog um, find that it's a difficult path, especially when they realize um, the amount of time and effort that's involved. But, uh, you know, a lot of people that I work with, with work with at StockTwits, and which has a blogging network itself, I think a lot of people have realized that it's, um, you know, a blog isn't necessarily end in and of itself. It's really a means by which um, you can put your ideas out there, people can contact you, and people can kind of interact with you. And that's kind of another aspect. It's not, it's not part and parcel of what we're talking about in the social web when we talk about, you know, the Facebooks and the Twitters of the world. But it's another way in which um, it allows people to interact with um, kind of the broader world. And I know you, I, and I just want to put one small plug in for email. And I know you guys, you guys all use email, but I think you're probably, my guess is that you're reluctant users of email. And when it comes to kind of, you know, interacting with other people, it's, your preference is probably for text or for Facebook or something like that. Um, but email is still, um, is still a big part of the, uh, still big part of commerce and I think um, a lot of people are still there are a lot of smart people still putting a lot of money and effort into uh, email and if you think about a company like Groupon it was really built on the back of email obviously they do have apps which allow you to interact with Groupon but it was really built on email and I think I think it's that is kind of an example of how it is that you know we think about this is a technology that's really um, you know you could say that it's kind of you know something from the past and from the past decade, but it's really not gone yet. So, you know, that's often, you know, that, that's the kind of the history of media. Every time there's a new form of media that comes out, you're going to think, uh, you know, you know, the mo you know, TV's going to kill the movies. Well, it didn't kill the movies. It kind of transformed in a, in a different way. And um, as every new medium that comes out in terms of media, you think it's going to kill, 
kill things off, but you think about email as an example. Yeah, and a lot of, in a certain respects, the social social media is a um, a more immediate and a better way to interact with people. But that doesn't mean that email is dead. So um, email still drives commerce, and um, that's kind of an example of what it is that um, how business is is done. It, business is about you know generating sales and generating revenue, and email is still formed a form by which that a lot of companies still rely on. So, um, and just kind of finishing up, talking about the new, we're talking about the new resume and talking about social media. And Lee Drogan, who works at Stocktwits, had this tweet just today. He says, social media is the new resume. If you can prove your skills out in the open and build social capital, you don't need a Goldman Sachs on your resume. And that's the idea of kind of putting your best foot forward in these, all these, these various forums and kind of putting yourself out there in a certain respect. And if people are able to see you uh, acting in real time and talking about things in real time, it kind of essentially kind of helps to prove your um, it helps to prove your skills and it helps to show people what it is that you're the way that you think and the way that you act and the way that you react. So, and so I saw and again I was doing this presentation just in the last few days, so I was able to pull in some really great things and I had a slide here which had um, all sorts of different I had all sorts of bullet points and I saw this quote which I thought made the point much better than I ever could. So in all these cases, the medium of blog, Twitter, the Kindle, even the internet itself isn't the important thing. It's just a way of connecting people with things that matter to them and with other people who matter to them. That's the real power, regardless of the medium. So whether we're talking about a specific form of social media, we're really talking about how it is that social media connects people to people and how it connects people to information. And if you think about, if you think about the way those two um, those two, those two ways that we act and interact with people and information, and you use that as kind of your framework and thinking about this entire space, it kind of gives you a better idea how to think about things. So when we're talking, you know, any specific sort of pro you know, process um, or social um, media site is less important than how it is that it connects people and it connects people to information. And in, and in the world of finance and investments, um, like, in very, like in other industries, that's really, that's, those are the things that are really important, and it's trying to get uh, get information in a timely fashion and in a time in a way that you um, want to get it, and um, interacting with other people as well. Because you know, uh, in that respect, um, our ideas are only proof. You know, the the financial markets are, in a certain respect, um, interesting because you al it allows you to test your ideas and your thesis in real time. You know, you have a you have a viewpoint on company X Y Z. You buy a company X Y Z, but another way of doing that is also to um, not only just doing the financial traction it's transaction itself, but it's also allow, but it's also in the way that you uh, put that I idea out there and allow it to be um, kind of tested not only by the market itself but by people themselves as well. So um, that is my conclusion. That's my talk. Um, again, uh, you know my area my area of expertise is in the blogosphere, but I think. Um, I kind of have a bit of a, a bit of a perspective on all these things, so um, I hope that gives you some perspective on the world in which you're living today and in the world in which you're likely to be living in for for quite some time now. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Do you think the influence of social media is going to continue to grow, or do you think it's about where it's going to peak or so? Um, that's a great question. I don't know that it's ever. You know, if you think about it in these terms. I don't know that's ever going to peak. I think it may, you know, the specific form that it takes um, might change. You know, is Facebook going to be where, you know, is it going to be the company that it is today in five or ten years? There could be something way cooler that comes along in the next few years that completely that makes Facebook look like MySpace. So the specific form in which it takes might change, but I think the fact that we have this ability to interact with people um, you know, family, friends, colleagues, just people who are interested in the same things, I don't think that's going to change. So I think that's, I think if anything, the, what the past few weeks have shown us um, in a, on the political side of things is that this desire for information and for uh, collaboration and interaction I think is there. And it's, you know, even, and especially in a, in a society where that sort of thing is, you know, frowned upon by, uh, you know the the government and officials. I think it's 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 felt in an even more acute way, and I think we have 
And I think to that degree, we feel in a you know, kind of an open society and a technologically uh, focused society, we kind of feel like these things are, um, they're almost kind of like a utility, you know. Turn on the water, you turn on the internet, you know, you turn on um, the social media. So I think the way we think about it, um, I, don't think the, I don't think the way social media is going to go away, the way, we, the way it might go, the way it, it might change in its form and fashion going forward, but I think there's always going to be this desire to connect with, connect with people and connect with information. So I don't think that's, I don't think that's likely to change. It may even, may even increase in some sense. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I think that's, you know, I don't know that I, I can, you know, I'm a, I'm a firm of one person, so I don't have a lot of internships. So I don't know that, I, I think that's, um, you know, I, you know I, I think it goes in a couple of different ways. I think, you know, one of my colleagues sent me a, a link to one of his old posts and I should have included in this, um, included in this presentation and the title of his blog post was, The Resume is Dead. And what he was saying there, obviously there's a, a bit of hyperbole there, but the idea being that when you're kind of living out in this sort of world, you're, you're in a certain sense you're out there already. And what you're doing and what you're saying is public and in a certain respect audited. If you say something at a certain time, somebody can go back and look at it and see it. And that's a very different thing than somebody saying, writing on their resume, I had an internship at uh, such and such bank and I did, I did this, this, and this. Well how do I know you did this and this and this? You said you did, you know, what did you, what did you learn for it? You know, do I have to call somebody, come somebody there to see that you, what it is that you actually did and what your responsibilities were? Whereas um, if you put up a blog and you put up some analysis and it's, uh, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, it was out there and somebody can, in a certain respect, it's open. It's like, you know, it's almost like in a certain respect putting your, you know, your essay exams online. Anybody, you know, allows anybody to read what it is you're thinking and doing. And I think um, in that respect, I think it's, um, it's a much more sort of open approach. And I think the degree, and, and this is a kind of a difference, I think, in the way that people think about things. It's people who kind of embrace, who have kind of have a sort of a social media or a social web ethos recognize that, yeah, if you're making decisions in real time, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes of fact, you're going to make mistakes in judgment, and how you react to that and how you either, you know, go back, you know, try and fix those um, and take responsibility for those, I think is far more important than, you know, getting the analysis precisely correct. And I think in that respect, um, if, somebody, if somebody who's coming at it from a different perspective and, and would only look at it in sort of a critical fashion and say, you know, oh, in your blog, you know, you put up this, you know, put up this analysis of, take an example, Chipotle, and it turned out to be, you know, incorrect in some fashion, you know, I'm going to ding you for that. Whereas, look, you know, I might look at it and I'll say, you know, this analysis was, you know, in, you know, in a certain respect interesting and, you know, had a different take on things. And I think that's, and I think that's the way that sort of kind of the transformation over time, it's kind of, um, it's never really, nothing is ever really kind of written in stone um, in that respect. So these things always, you know, everything evolves over time. Um, and our ideas about things evolve over time. So saying, having an opinion about um, Google today, your opinion might change in that in a week or two weeks or some new piece of information comes out and your opinion might very well change. So the idea that it's really, everything is just kind of a first draft, and that's very much kind of a blogging ethos. You know, you put up a blog post and um, people comment it, people, you know, people, um, you know, criticize it, people agree, you know, they may agree with it, uh, but it's really just kind of a first draft. And when you see things kind of evolve in the blogosphere, somebody writes something, somebody else expands on it, tweaks it a little bit, and it just kind of, it's kind of a daisy chain. And I think you don't really, nothing's ever really, um, kind of a finished product in that sense. And I think that's a different way of looking at the world than, 
you know, I think that's different than looking kind of at a hard copy piece, you know, resume, whereas, you know, I spent this, you know, I spent this internship, you know, these six months at this company, I did this, this, and this. I think it's kind of a different way of kind of looking at the world. And, 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 you may, and people might, you know, if, you know, somebody puts up a blog and they go for, an, you know, go for a job or an internship, I, my, my bet is that the majority of, the majority of people still have that sort of mindset. That they might look on it as um, something, you know, something that is, that they're, you know, particularly skeptical about. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to give any advice on anybody what it is that they should, you know, how they should be spending their time because I think that this is a transformation that's sort of ongoing and I don't think it's, by any means is it, um, I don't think it's the norm as of yet. You know, if you think, and just, you know, if you think about it, if the people you meet, if you're, if you're going for a job or the people you meet or some of you're asking out on a date, what's the first thing that you do? You might, you probably, you might Google them, you might look them up on Facebook, you might see if you have, you know, common friends. And that's kind of, you know, that's a, that's a very different, you know, kind of thought process than, um, you know, can I see your, you know, can I see your resume? You know, what is, where have you been? What have you done? Sort of, sort of thinking. So, there's a question over here. Uh, yeah, I had a question. You talked about how um, stock codes used to be like, you know, not as easy to procure like they are now. Uh, do you think like actual information flow will become like, free uh, over the internet, you know, social media, like analysis or like, research or something? Will there be like a free flow in like that kind of information, not just sentiment? Oh, I, I think, I mean, I think it's already, I think it's already moving in that direction. I think uh, we were talking about this at dinner. We were talking about how it is that um, a lot of blogs uh, today feel pretty comfortable in posting, um, you know, PDFs of uh, research from, um, uh, from the sell side. And it doesn't seem like, and I, and I could be incorrect on this, I've never heard of a sell side firm trying to get a takedown notice on one of these uh, one of these research pieces. So I think a lot of this stuff sort of leaks out um, on its own. And in a big area in which this is happening is, um, you know, hedge funds every quarter, or, you know, on a quarterly basis or annual basis, put out all of these investment letters to their to their um, to the investors in their hedge funds. And these letters aren't aren't necessarily supposed to get out into the public public domain. They're supposed to stay um, with the investors themselves, in part because it could um, it can be viewed by um, the uh, the SNC as and others as um, partaking in marketing of hedge funds, which are not supposed to be done in a public sort of fashion. But this stuff leaks out all the time, and I think um, all of this information is kind of coming online in various forms and fashions. And I think, you know, in a kind of a big macro sense, look at WikiLeaks. I mean, you can't really. I don't think governments and banks and everybody, I think every, it's very hard for organizations like that to really believe that any information is truly secure these days. And I think whether it's, you know, investment research or uh, things like that, I don't think, you know, trying to lock it down even more tightly, I think is uh, kind of working against what's really happening in kind of the broader world. I guess going off of that, a couple, a couple amazing things that I've I think it's pretty interesting is on Twitter, I don't remember the, the handle, I think it's maybe Market Folly, but uh, I don't know how he has this information, but it's like a hedge fund reports mm -hmm. of what all their holdings are, which well, is those, public. Yeah, those are, I've, um, I, I, uh, I've, I've spoken with Jay at Market Folly, and he actually works at a hedge fund, um, but that's not where he's, that's then it's kind of separate and apart from that. On a quarterly basis, um, managers of a certain size are required to report their positions to in marketable securities to the SEC, so these it's, it's called um, a 13F filing, and all that information is um, goes to the SEC, and now it's you can get it in kind of a um, you know a, 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 um, a market in a technology readable form. So there are people who analyze this data on a certain fashion. There are companies that have been aggregating this data uh, for certain managers and trying you know using this as an investment strategy. So I look at. Um, I look at the top holdings of these various hedge funds and use that as a, you know, as a, as a portfolio tool to use that as a stock selection tool. There are a lot of issues with the 13F data because you only get, you only get particular data for, um, uh, you know, certain marketable securities. You don't get the entire picture of a portfolio. So you don't necessarily, 
You don't necessarily know what the short positions are. You don't know, necessarily know what positions in um, uh, various over-the-counter derivatives. So you may see, you can see kind of part of the portfolio. And if somebody has a big position in a, in a stock, you can, you know, you can kind of logically believe that they have, you know, that they have um, some, a strong belief in that company. But yeah, but that data is, a lot of that data is out there. But I think, I think Jay at Market Folly would tell you that, that data needs a lot of massaging to get it to a point where you can really use it as any sort of, um, any sort of signal. But yeah, that's, a lot of that's, that data is already, it's kind of out there. And you know, again, but the, again, it's that's that's data that you get with a lag. Yes. Well, I, the, one, the one probably advantage, as it were, that I have had is that I have been um, exposed to a lot of different areas and a lot of different, um, of different, different markets and different modes of analysis. Um, so kind of, um, so in that respect, I have a kind of a pretty broad perspective on what I think is important and interesting. And in that, and to that degree, um, given the amount of information that I look at and that other legal people look at, it's really, um, it's almost like a gut level reaction. It's like that's interesting, that's not. That's actionable, that's not. And so to that degree, I really, you know, given the amount of stuff that I look at and kind of the time constraints that we all have, it's very much a um, kind of an instinctual sort of um, sort of approach to that to that thing. And like I said. Um, these are all kind of first, it's all, when you're blogging, it's all kind of a first draft and things that you thought were interesting a couple weeks ago may become more interesting. Um, things you didn't think were interesting a couple of days ago might blow up on you. So there's different, um, you kind of always, in that respect, you get surprised. Um, you're kind of constantly surprised by the things that, not only that um, my reactions to different information, but the way other people react as well. So, and you know, when you're blogging on a daily basis, the one thing that I have found that I've seen is that I quickly get tired of stories. So um, a story will happen, it comes out, and I think, ah, oh, that's interesting, and that's, you know, it has some sort of uh, content or information that I think is interesting to investors. But my, my, my always sense is that the media always holds on to a story and it kind of drags it along until it, you know, kind of beats it to death. And I've gotten, I've usually gotten long tired of a story. Um, before the media ever does. For an, like a particular example of that was this week was Bernie Madoff um, did an interview from his jail, you know, from his jail cell with um, New York Magazine, and I and, and a lot of people picked up on it, and he made you know all sorts of you know all sorts of statements about not only about his uh, criminality but also kind of the broader the idea that the entire you know the entire financial U.S. financial markets are a you know a Ponzi scheme. Um, and I thought, and I, and I never linked to any of that stuff because I thought, um, I'm really tired of Bernie Madoff and his, um, and his BS. And it really doesn't, I don't think anything that Bernie Madoff has to tell us today is really, is going to affect, should affect the way that you invest going forward. So that's a particular story. That was just one from this week that I thought was, uh, where, my, where my reaction to it was very different than a lot of other people's. Yeah. Um, a lot of news and media sources like ABC, Fox, um, are always afraid of getting their information out uh, for free. Like, mm -hmm. it's out for free on social networks. So, um, do you see any trends um, in monetization of the social networks? Um, that's <coughs> definitely not my um, area of expertise. I think people. I think we all rec. I think we people are. You know, I think there's two things working, working in kind of uh, juxtaposition. I think we've all kind of become, in the internet age, we've all kind of become um, accustomed to getting stuff for free. You know, um, just about all of the internet is, you know, everything that we see on the web nearly is free, uh, maybe with some constraints. And I think, 
the entire, you know, all of these media companies are all struggling with this, in, you know, with this entire, uh, with the idea of how that they can monetize, monetize content. And New York Times looks like they're going to take another whack at putting up a paywall, trying to, um, you know, generate more revenue that way. And I don't know that there's any way to, um, I don't have the answer to that. And I think monetization is always going to be a challenge. And I think, but I think, I think what we do see is that people are willing to pay for uh, content that they find, you know, that they find interesting. I think, and at the right price. I think a great example of that is Netflix. You know, I think most people are willing to pay. I'm trying to remember what the stream only fee is: seven ninety nine a month, eight ninety nine, something like that. I think a lot of people are willing to pay um, for, you know, streaming only of movies and TV shows, um, you know, on various devices at that price point. Um, you can argue, yeah, you know, you're not going to get the, you know. You're not going to get the movie when it first hits the, you know, the first hits DVD, or it's not going to be at the same time you could see it on pay-per-view. But I think a lot of people are willing to make that compromise, and a lot of people pay for, you know, pay for Netflix in one form or fashion. So I think that's one example of where uh, you see people willing to pay for, um, you know, media in, a, in uh, you know, on the internet. So I think that's one example. That may not be the best example, but I think that's that's one example. It's not perfect, but it's something that, are, that it's, it provides enough. It pro provides enough of a service and enough convenience that I think people are willing to pay for that. Yeah. Yeah. Earlier, you talked about how Bloomberg was able to create a business around kind of aggregating all the data mm -hmm. on Wall Street and selling that to people. I was wondering, given that it seems like the social media industry is really fragmented. For example, you could find analysis about individual stocks a lot of different websites. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee some consolidation or some way of aggregating all that information together to get a better read on sentiment as a possibility in the future or as a good thing? Um, I, people are already, I mean, people are trying to do that. And I think um, there are services, I was reading a story today about some services that are um, doing that right now, trying to track sentiment, whether it be um, and they're using it from various different forms, you know, using Twitter feeds, um, using, you know, using the stream from stock twits and aggregating it across, you know, the entire internet and trying to do that. And how they, how they do that exactly is, is a great question, but I don't think you're ever going to have any single, any single central repository where you can kind of look at all this stuff in a sort of real time fashion because, you know, look, everybody, everybody wants to try and keep their, uh, garner an audience, try and create a business, try and create, just carve out a niche in that space. So, um, yeah, and I think there are areas in which you see, you do see collaboration and where it makes sense, um, but I think there's always going to be competition and you're never going to have um, all of that information all in, one sp all in one place and one time and one space. I think you could also argue that just having such a high number of participants on a given site kind of lowers the quality of interaction you know that's that's always you know that's always um, a challenge, and I think everybody anybody who tries to build a community is always cognizant of that. And I think um, trying to generate, you know, it's always this issue of you know signal to noise ratio and how much of it is noise and how much of it is signal. And yeah, as these things uh, grow over time, there is that risk that the noise begins to outweigh any sort of signal. But again, I think then you're looking at, but again, uh, it's going to iterate over time. You're either going to apply, um, apply different tools to try and extract that signal from the, from the stream of information and from the stream of sentiment in sort of an automated fashion. Or um, you know, if something gets too big, then eventually parts of it kind of break off. And you get you know, different, sorts of, uh, different sorts of communities, whether it be focused in on uh, you know different sorts of verticals or different sorts of time horizon. You know we talked about, you know we talked about the various time horizons of various um, players in the social web. So you may just see, and you already see a little bit of that already. People with different time horizons want to interact in a different sort of fashion. Um, you know somebody who's a professional analyst is really looking at, um, you know, in-depth analysis, whereas a day trader is looking for, um, you know, has a very different time horizon and various sorts of different information needs. So. Again, um, yeah, I, and I think that's, you know, that's the beauty and that's the challenge of it. The ability to do these things, 
the cost of all the the cost of um, doing this has come down over time. Just the technology costs, you, the cost of things, you know, being able to do that today is far less expensive than it was a year, two years, five years ago. So you're always going to see startups. You're always going to see people trying to, um, you know, take a chunk out of the space in one in one way or another. There aren't going to be many people who are able to achieve, um, you know, a Facebook-like status where it's, you know, everybody. Um, those are going to be. That's going to be the exception. It's going to be. It's going to be more niche. It's going to be more vertical. It's going to be people talking about, um, you know, in different industries, talking, you know, talking to themselves is, is the likely sort of, the way it starts of is likely to fragment. Any other questions? All right. I think that's. Uh, look, I see that we're uh, we're going to have to give up the room here in a minute. So. Uh, thank you very much, um, and if you want to uh, come up and ask me questions after this, that's fine. And um, you know, it can always you can always find me on uh, on Twitter and StockTwits at AdMomentReturns. So, thank you very much. Thank you.